Archiving started. Hello and welcome to Lawrence Technological University in Southfield, Michigan to the Robotics Engineering Laboratory for part five of our uh, series on PID controllers, theory and practice. And this last video, we will talk about the difference between motor velocity, controlling velocity with a PI controller, like we talked about before, and now controlling motor position, where we want to use a PD, or proportional derivative control, as opposed to the PI control that we used before. So I say, I keep saying, don't use the PI control. Well, why not? Well, let's take a look. Here is the control system and the model that we've been using all along. This is the same DC motor. This is the same PI control with the same gain that we had back in the third video. The only difference is instead of connecting to the velocity, I've connected now to the um, position or angle output of the model. And I've also changed the target position to be 60 degrees instead of 500 RPM. That's it, same controller. What happens when I run it? Well, it's the proverbial disaster. Um, takes a while to get to the target, it overshoots, it oscillates, and when I put my load disturbance on, like I put on it before, it actually runs it backwards a couple of revs, and then it oscillates, and it's just all over the place. This is not the same behavior we had before. You know, before, if you recall, when I was controlling velocity, um, if this is my target, you know, it just came up and hit that target, and then when we applied the disturbance, there's a little bit of dip, and it was right there. You know, it's just not the same thing at all. Why? You know, what's up with that, dude? So, what's the difference? Well, here's our DC motor itself, the model back from uh, video two. This is the equa these are the equations for the electrical side. Here's the you know current to torque and and speed to back EMF equations built into that model, and here we have our mechanical side where we have a torque, we have inertia. Divide the torque by inertia, we get acceleration. We integrate the acceleration, we get velocity. We integrate the velocity again, and we get angle or position. Okay. So the difference between this output and this output is quite simply this integrator, okay? That is the difference. We've added an integrator into the system. So what does that mean when we try to do the control? Well, by adding this integrator in here, I've kind of changed the way this behaves. Um, let me go back up. You know, instead of having and this, this is the plot of this motor, you know, if I input a constant voltage, I end up with a relatively constant speed, right? And I apply the disturbance and then the speed levels out a different value. But the basic idea is that a constant input gives me a constant output when I'm controlling velocity. Here, when I'm trying to measure the speed, or excuse me, the position, that constant 10 volt input gives me an ever, ever increasing, ever changing output, okay, because of that, because the motor keeps turning, that angle keeps getting bigger, it's, it's integrating, it's got that extra integrator in the basic physics of the way this works. So we've added this integrator and we've got this constantly increasing output for a constant input and that's what's messing us all up. Because if we were to go back, um, sorry, to that slide, Effectively, what I've done, if I was connected back to my velocity like I was before, it says here, I've essentially put in, I can move that integrator right there, okay? And that's the same thing mathematically as, is what I, what we were controlling in the previous slide. And if I play a little bit loose with the math, uh, I can move this integrator all the way over into the controller itself, okay? It, 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 gets a little loose, the math gets a little loose when I go across that subtraction, but we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll ignore that right now. Um, because I just want to kind of explain in a practical sense. So really what I've done is I've added this integration and effectively it's like I had the integrator there and I had the integrator there, okay? 
Well, what happens, this is my proportional gain, okay, which is just a proportion of proportional constant times the error. When I add that integrator, I get, I get you know, kp integral v equals the integral of kp times the error. Well, what does that look like? Well, that looks just like our integral control, right? It doesn't look like proportional control anymore. That proportional term is really behaving like an integral term because of that integration back, back inside our plant. And what did we say about uh, integral versus proportional control back in the, I think it was the third video? Um, you know, proportional is fast. It's not accurate. Integral is accurate, but it's slow, and it tends to not be real stable. It's destabilizing. So we've taken our fast controller, and we've turned it into a slow, not-so-stable control there. And then in our integral term, we've added this integrator from in the plant. So effectively, we've turned it into a double-I controller. And what are the characteristics of double-I? And the answer is it's not very stable, and it's even slower than just I. So when we look at the way it behaved with it, with our PI control, what do we see? We see slow and we see a lot of oscillations. We've lost stability, we've lost speed, we've lost performance. That's because we don't, it's not behaving like a PI controller anymore, even though that's what we put in our software. Because of that extra lurking integrator back here, it's behaving more like an I double I controller, which is not, it's just not what we want. So what happens how do we fix that? How do you, um, you know, if, if, if I have um, an integrator, how do I undo that? Well, back in the first video, we talked about the integrator is the opposite of the differentiator, right? The integrator und undoes differentiation, and differentiation undoes integration. Does that make sense? I hope. Uh, so what we can do is put a derivative uh, in front of each of these to kind of undo that, um, that integrator that's in the plant. So if I put the derivative, and I'm just going to draw it after here because i got room. So I, you know, I put a, you know, d by dt. It's hard to write in that little box. So essentially I've now turned this proportional control into a derivative control. And if I put another derivative in here, and I'm not going to try and write that, well, that derivative is going to undo this integrator, right? And now I've converted what my, my integral control into a proportional control. So the functional equivalent of our PI controller when we have this extra integrator hidden inside our plant is the PD control, okay, or DP if you want. So I, and then the, the derivative behaves like proportional, and the proportional in our implementation behaves like, like the, the integral behaves like the proportional. The derivative, no, sorry. <laughs> the, the proportion, <laughs> this becomes our D term, right? Our D term behaves like proportional, and our P, this becomes the P term, and that behaves like the integral. I was getting confused with that proportional and integral written there. And, okay. So what happens when we throw a PD control in there, where I have just a straight proportional, and I have a derivative gain times the derivative of that gain times the error? Here's the performance. Voila. What more could you ever want, right? We nailed it. We just nailed this puppy. Um, it's fast. It's accurate. Even here where I add this load disturbance, you, you can't even see it. You know, we, we've uh, probably the gains are a little bit high or something. But um, it, it, it just does what it needs to do. And we've, we solved that problem we had with all the instability and stuff by just stopping and thinking about how the plant works and how the plant has that extra integrator and how we can undo it by using a PD instead of PI. Now, that's not to say there isn't a place for PID. Um, you know, this model is a well-behaved 
linear model where at you know at at uh, if this is voltage and this is speed you know as soon as I get any voltage at all I get some kind of speed you know it it just follows that path it it starts right at the origin and away you go now if you've got a real motor and you've got a gearbox on the end and you've got things like that and maybe you got a robot sitting on a carpet or whatever the tendency is very low voltages or, or very low duty cycles, like we talked about in our H-bridge um, video, um, you tend to not get any speed at all. And you get, you get a behavior that's more like, like this, okay? Some nonlinear behavior where you got kind of a dead band in here. Sometimes that can cause you problems. There's different ways to fix it. One is to just try to add this much to the controller output all the time, either positive or negative. Let me draw that in a different color. So you, you'd always add, you know, this much to the controller output to try and overcome that. That works if this dead band is consistent. If it's variable, it's not such a good thing. You can maybe put half of it in there or three quarters of it. Uh, another thing you can do is is add this little bit of integral gain, but just keep the gains low so it integrates very slowly, uh, put some kind of saturation or clips on that integrator so it doesn't doesn't get too big and doesn't start destabilizing it. So that wraps up that. Um, thank you for listening if you filed through this whole thing. Um, and I'll say uh, Lawrence Tech is uh, uh, we have a Bachelor of Science in Robotics Engineering degree here which is, I think, a good program and a lot of fun. I encourage you to check it out at www.ltu.edu slash robotics. Um, if you're in the area, feel free to drop by and visit the uh, robotics lab, and we'll talk to you later. Thank you.